Welcome to the uh, uh, computer, uh, computer Security Seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Michael Shearer. He will speak on uh, exploiting banners for fun and uh, profits. Michael. Thank you. Let's talk today about um, using information gained in web banners or in... I, I'll, I'll go back and forth between the word header and banner. What I'm talking about is the same thing. Uh, and talk about how we can use information gained in batters to exploit systems. Um, I am an associate for Booz Allen Hamilton. I live in uh, Maryland. Uh, I also have my uh, I own a small business called Leverage Consulting and Associates. I spent eight years, uh, almost nine years in the Navy as an EA6B uh, electronic uh, countermeasures officer. Um, I have done some uh, combat missions over Afghanistan and Iraq, and then I spent nine months on the ground doing counter IED work with the U.S. Army uh, as well. Founding member, one of the founding members of the Church of Wi-Fi, which is a wireless hacking group, um, Unallocated Space, which is a hacker space located in Severn, Maryland, and a father of four. Keeps me busy. So... What I'm going to talk today is about a search engine called Shodan. Uh, Shodan is uh, a search engine, but it's unlike most search engines that you're familiar with. We'll talk about the basic operations of the search engine. We'll talk about how we can use this search engine for penetration testing. We'll go through a number of case studies of how we can use this information and how we can apply it to information that's already on the Internet. Uh, and then we'll uh, draw some conclusions from that. When I use the word penetration testing, um, I use it in a very broad sense to mean any of these things. Uh, you may go on to jobs in any of these fields, and what I mean when I use the word penetration testing, while it may have a specific definition, my definition today means all of these things. So uh, black, gray, or white box testing, ethical hacking, security auditing, vulnerability assessments, compliance with different standards, uh, if you're doing training, any or all of the above is what I mean by penetration testing. So we'll talk about Shodan and what it is as a search engine. Shodan is, is a website. It's located at ShodanHQ.com. Uh, it was developed by uh, a web developer named John Matherly. And John is not a penetration tester, and he was not involved in computer security. He was just a web developer, and he designed the search engine for marketing and advertising and research purposes. Uh, however, quickly, uh, soon after he had introduced the website, uh, penetration testers, such as myself and others, uh, quickly saw that there were some interesting applications of the search engine that he did not intend. Um, so while it is a search engine, it's different from Yahoo or Google or Bing. So a typical search engine will crawl a website for data, and it's looking for the information on that page. So if it's an article about someone, or if it's information about Purdue, then that information gets pulled back and indexed into the search engine. So when you search for Purdue or Sirius, that, that, that's the result that comes up. Shodan is different because it's not concerned about the actual data on the web page. It's actually concerned about the metadata or the information about the web page. In other words, not what's the article about, but what server is that, it was, what server is that software, or what's the software running on that box? Uh, what ports are, are open on that box? So we're interrogating certain ports, mostly uh, port 80, but also port uh, 22, 23, uh, and some others. So we're looking for the content about the web page, or the content about the server itself, not the content on the web page. So instead of finding specific content on the web, what we're looking for is finding specific nodes. So desktops, servers, routers, switches that have specific content in their banner. Optimizing our search results is going to require some basic knowledge of banners. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, this is what the Shodan search engine looks like uh, on the front page. It just looks like any other search engine. You're going to have a search box, and you're going to be able to enter information in. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to, this is kind of the first 10 or 15 minutes of the talk here is, is just some very basic background about Shodan and how to use it. But the bulk of the presentation I want to spend talking about uh, the case studies. 
So search terms are entered into a text box, just like you see there. Uh, you can use quotation marks to narrow a search. You can use Boolean operations to include or exclude certain terms. Uh, we'll see that uh, excluding certain information is very useful for filtering data. So there's two ways to use Shodan. You could just go to the web page and use it without any account. Just use it anonymously. However, there's some limitations to Shodan uh, without an account. If you do have one of these accounts, Google, Twitter, Yahoo, AOL, Facebook, OpenID, you can use those accounts, your credentials from those accounts to log into Shodan, or you can create a Shodan account by itself. Uh, there's a number of filters with Shodan. For example, there's a country filter that we'll talk about. And that filter is one of the examples of something that's not available to you unless you log in. These are some of the basic filters that are available in Shodan. Um, the, uh, the filter itself is just the word followed by the colon, so what you see in bold here. So for example, uh, Shodan's been, uh, search engine has been collecting information for about a year and a half now. If you only wanted uh, data in the last three months, for example, you could say use the after filter. Uh, the country filter we'll talk about uh, just using a two-letter country code. So if you want just results from specific countries. Uh, and we'll talk about the rest of these filters as we see them. So at the in the search box there, I know it's a little difficult to see. I duplicated it in the blue box there. And the actual search that I typed in here is, is just the word Apache and then a space and then country colon CH. So what I'm looking for here is uh, web banners that have the word Apache in uh, and limit that to uh, country code CH, which is Switzerland. So any IP addresses that are assigned to a net block that belongs to Switzerland and they have the word Apache in the banner are going to come up. And what you see on the screen below that, which is a little difficult to see, are the actual results. So what you have here is, here's the IP address over here. And if I click on that IP address, it would actually take me to that web page. And then the web banner itself is right here. So uh, the word Apache you see here is in, is in red. Any search terms will show up in red. So this is the first, this is when we say a web banner or the header, this is the information we're talking about here. So knowing what this information is, is helpful to finding out, uh, is helpful to, to narrowing down our searches. In this search, I just searched for, the search term was Apache 2.2.3. So now you can see we're looking for a specific version of Apache. And you can see here in these, in these results, in the red here, all these servers are running Apache 2.2.3. If we don't enter a country code in, Shodan will re uh, return for us uh, the top countries that match the search with a link to that. So for example, when we type in Apache 2.2.3, there are 382,000 results from the United States, 64,000 for Germany, etc. So sorted from the most prevalent countries to the, to, to the least prevalent or the less. Here are a couple other searches to show you what the hostname filter is. The hostname filter searches results uh, using a portion of the host or do domain name. So for example, Apache hostname colon dot nist dot gov. So that's only going to find results in the .nist.gov domain. The second one, the second example here is IAS-5.0 hostname.edu. So this, what this will find for us is IAS 5.0 servers, so that's Microsoft Windows 2000, that are running in the .edu domain. So any universities or schools or anyone that has edu. And we could, all, we could uh, change that to be more specific to purdue.edu or you know, whatever we were looking for. So at this point, you can start to see why uh, the banner information would be important to us. Let me give you an example. Microsoft Windows 2000, which is IAS 5.0, is now over a decade old. There's a lot of vulnerabilities that exist in that. Microsoft doesn't support it anymore. So, so if there are servers out there that are running Microsoft uh, Windows 2000, chances are there's, there's vulnerabilities associated with those servers. So now what we have found is that without even going to the site itself, we know that it could be potentially vulnerable. 
Some additional uh, basic operations filters are a net filter, which allows you to search by an IP or CIDR notation. If you only want um, 7 dot something or 10 dot something, uh, or 10 wouldn't work because it's internal, but if you wanted a specific uh, CIDR notation, uh, an OS filter if you want to search by certain um, or find searches by a certain operating system. For example, uh, we showed on this previous example of Apache. Well, you know, Apache could be run on Linux or Windows. If we used a uh, search for Apache and then an OS filter of Windows, it would only give us, the, it would refine those results to Apaches that are, or Apache installations running on a Windows operating system. Shodan can also filter uh, results by port. Uh, the large majority of collection in Shodan is, is port 80, so it's web traffic. Uh, but there's also 21 FTP, 22 SSH, uh, 23 Telnet, uh, SNMP on 161, and then uh, some SIP on our VoIP on uh, 5060. Like I said, the large majority of what you will see in Shodan is port 80. But there's some additional uh, results being added uh, as time goes on. There are also some uh, SSL filters. Uh, uh, port 443 was just added to Showdown, so a lot of that information is being collected. And again, we're not talking now about the content of the page. Uh, we're talking about the information, cert version, issuer, subject, all the stuff you see here. won't go into any more detail than that, just to mention that those the filters are available. Let me stop and, and let you know that if you have questions uh, at any point in the presentation, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I will save a couple some time at the end of the presentation, but if you have questions or if I'm jumping over something that you're confused about, feel free to just interrupt and ask the question. Shodan has a search history, uh, which is optional. Um, you can enable it. It's disabled by default, um, but you can enable it. So why would you want to, for example, disable your searches? Well, if you are searching for something uh, that is... Um, somewhat sensitive and you don't want other people to know what you're searching for, that would be a good, a good reason to disable your searches. Um, so another, why would you want to enable your searches? Well, you may find things that are interesting in Shodan that you want other people to see. Uh, when, you log, when you go into Shodan, you can see um, most popular searches, things that other people have searched for. So you can kind of click on those searches, see what they've found with those searches. Um, so the search history requires you to have an account. So we talked about how you don't have to log in. That's one of the things. If you do want to have a search history, obviously you have to have an account associated with it. Uh, Shodan lets you ex export up to uh, 1,000. I think it's grown higher now, a certain number of results in XML format. Um, there's some credits that you can purchase. They're a couple dollars. I don't, I don't pet deal with the credits or anything. Um, but uh, it is available if that's something, you, if you're looking for a large data set to look at. There are some add-ons for Shodan, HTTPS with uh, SSL, which I did talk about. Um, if you don't log into Shodan or if you just have a basic account, you're, you're only see a limited number of search results, 50 or 100. Um, um, the add-on would give you up to 10,000 results, and it will also get you uh, access to, tel to Telnet information that is added into Shodan. Okay, so that's the first part of the presentation, and that's just talking to you about what Shodan is to give you an idea of the search engine itself and what you can do with it. Like I said, when John developed Shodan, this was designed as a marketing and research and advertising tool to gather information. It was not designed for penetration testing. So I want to talk about, you can sort of see, like I mentioned, oh, if you're looking for a specific version of software, you can start to see now how this could apply to penetration testing. So there's a few ethical questions that we should talk about before we, do, before we go any further because we're talking about, you know, looking at uh, devices or uh, other people's networks that we don't own or we don't have permission to look at, that we don't have permission to access. So let's talk about what we can do when, with a, a random device on the Internet uh, that, we don't have, that, we, that we don't know anything about. So these are sort of ethical questions that, that, that would come up. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll talk about where we would place these on, on a sort of on a scale. So would it, be, would it be acceptable to view the configuration of a device if it requires no authentication to view? 
So if we just go to a web page, and it's, we'll see an example of this later, it will be obvious to you when you see this page that it was not intended to be public, however it is. However, there was no username or password required for us to get there. So is, is it okay for us to view that? The second would be, what about viewing the configuration of a device when someone used a default username or password? Now, obviously, they're using a, a, they didn't change it, which is, the, which is bad on them. However, they're still using a password, so they're, they're intending for you not to see it. What about viewing the configuration of a device using a unique username and password? In other words, they changed it, but somehow you were able to get their password. Or what about changing the configuration of a device that you don't have any permission to own? So when I put these on a sort of white to black scale, this is where I would put, this is where I would put these questions. You certainly feel, feel free to disagree. The first one I said was, was viewing a page that requires no authentication. So this would be an example of someone puts something on the, on, on the internet, they intended to put a password, protect it, and they just they either configured it improperly or it was configured without a password, and anyone can see it. I think this is a fairly white uh, action on our part, or fairly benign uh, action in terms of what we're doing. Yes, they may not have intended for us to see it, but however, it doesn't require any authentication to see. The second one is using a default username and password. I think we're getting into a very gray area here and perhaps darker than that. Because now the user, uh, while still very insecurely using a default username and password, has, has clearly intended for you not to see the data. Um, and then the last two, using a unique username and password, or changing the configuration device, these are pretty much, you're crossing the line here. Uh, in terms of what what's you know legally and ethically acceptable, the reason I put this you know sort of in a in a in a shade here is because it's not very clear where where the legal line is. The circumstances of of an individual case may may be different. In some circumstances, you could argue that the first the first uh, example viewing a page with the end no, with no authentication, even though we we're not we're not intended to view it, could be a violation of the law. Um, in most cases, you know, it's unlikely that anybody would be prosecuted for that, but it's possible. Uh, so that's why I don't put a line and say, this is okay, this is not okay. This is this kind of a scale. There are, everything that I will show you today is, is of the first example. So viewing pages using no authentication with um, maybe two or three exceptions where, um, where default usernames and passwords were used. And I will point those out to you uh, so I, and I, I will show you, give you an example of why we did that. So we talked about uh, using Shodan for penetration testing and how it requires a basic knowledge of, of HTTP banners and status codes. Um, we will, we, as we've already seen, banners advertise versions of software, uh, the type of software they're running, the version. Um, banners can be spoofed because that data is can be manipulated by whoever's running the service, and it's unlikely, it's very rare that people actually spoof banners. So these are HTTP status codes, and this is the first thing we would see in response to a GET request. Um, and that code is going to tell us some information about that page. The most useful one in our case is a 200 OK, which means that the request succeeded, and it's going to allow us to view the web page. Anytime you go to a page and it loads successfully and you see what you intended to see, you're getting a 200 OK. The 300, 300 codes, the 301 and the 302, uh, have to do with uh, pages that have been moved. Uh, typically, in the case of Shodan, those are not very useful to us. Um, 401 is actually somewhat useful to us. 401 is an unauthorized code. And what that's telling us is that the page we're going to uh, requires some credential or authentication to get to, doesn't mean that we can't access it, <coughs> just that we need some authentication to, to, to view the page. A 403 code is a forbidden code, and that's just telling us that uh, I'm not going to let you see this page regardless of whether you have the right credentials or not. It could be based on an access list or uh, some block list that's preventing you from seeing that. So a 200 OK page is very good for us. That means we're going to see the page itself. 
it's not going to require, require any authentication. A 301 and 302, they typically don't contain data that's useful for us. However, we talked about we can use Boolean operations to filter. So you, all these codes are in every result. So we could use, for example, minus 301, minus 302 to get these, get these results out of our data set. A 401 unauthorized banner, uh, like we talked about, requires authentication. It will typically, typically be another line in the banner that says www.authenticate. And this typically indicates the presence of a pop-up box. Also, we'll see that some banners actually advertise default usernames and passwords. This doesn't mean that the devices themselves are using that, um, but in some cases they are. So for, we'll give you, I'll show you an example later of where a printer that has a web interface advertises the default password. And in the case of the example we're going to use, no one changed the password. So we were actually getting into the ad administrative interface for the printer. Okay, let's talk about case studies. The first case study is about Cisco devices. I know this um, banner is a little difficult to see, so I'm just going to read off the important parts to you. This is a 401 unauthorized banner from a Cisco device. On the first line, we have a 401 unauthorized, and in the second or the third line, it's, we have a www authenticate, uh, basic realm, level 15, or view access. So what this means is if we go to this IP address, we're going to get a pop-up box asking us for a username and password. And unless we have the correct authentication, we're not going to be able to view that page. Here's another banner for a Cisco device. This has a 200 OK, which means we can view the page. It also has a last modified line. Um, the significant, so here's these two banners side by side. One is a Cisco page that we cannot see a uh, Cisco device that we cannot look at without authenticating to. And another one is that's allowing us to see it. Um, it turns out that when you take a www authenticate and last modified and put them side by side, they're all more than 99% mutually exclusive. So what does this mean for us? Well, here's the results. This is, this is uh, as of a month or so ago. We search for the word Cisco in Shodan. We get almost 500,000 results. So what that means is there are, prop, there are roughly 500,000 devices that have been, captured, that have been um, on the internet uh, that have the word Cisco in their banner. So they're probably Cisco devices. When we start narrowing it down to WW Authenticate, 373,000, Cisco last modified, 8,700, and then the last modified and the WW authenticate only 35. So what does this mean? If we see a Cisco 200 OK banner that includes a last modified line, it indicates to us that there's about 8,700 Cisco devices on the internet right now that require no authentication to access. So you may recognize this as a, this is a web interface to a Cisco device. This is a Cisco switch. It's an 1812W. This is a web interface to an actual device, the actual switch. Um, you can see here on this line here, these are all HTML links to different levels of access. If you're familiar with Cisco devices, level 15 is like administrator or root access. So surely, um, once we got to this page, once we click on the, the level of access, um, it should ask us for the username and password, especially if at level 15 we could do anything we want to the device. It turns out that this doesn't exist. When we click on level 15, so let me go back one here. When we click on 15, you can see up here in the URL, you, maybe you can't see, it's level 15. So we now have level 15 access to this device. And we've done, we've done no password cracking. We've done no other information gathering. Other than to look at the banner, 
and figure out that the banner is actually structurally unsound because it's revealing information about the page that's not intended. It's actually telling us that the, that the device itself is, is not secure. If you're like me and you don't have your CCNA and you don't remember all the Cisco device commands, these web interfaces are very friendly because you can do, this is just the beginning of the page. You can scroll down the page and you can actually, instead of typing the commands up here, you can just click on them and it'll tell you, what to, it'll tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> so these are configure commands. This allows us to do any kind of configuration on the device itself with no authentication. Uh, I also went to the execute menu, so uh, executing commands on the, on the device, no authentication required at all. Um, on this device, I did not, ch like I mentioned, we're, we're not going to change configurations of devices, so we didn't do that. However, I did run two commands. One, first ran a command I ran was a show running config, which is just going to show us the configuration of the device. I don't show you the whole thing here on the left. Uh, but this is just the beginning of it, just to show you that the command actually ran and, and spit out results. Um, and the one on the right is a show CDP neighbors. And that's what that's going to do is show Cisco devices that are in proximity to the device we're looking at. It turns out that um, one of the or, or that some of the devices on the on the show CDP neighbors are actually um, in, important. Um, the the names of these two devices are. CN uh, hyphen CNC, uh, and turns out these are um, CNs, a country code for China, and CNC is uh, China Netcom, which is a large ISP in China. So these device, this device that we're looking at here is actually sitting next to um, some infrastructure, infrastructure level switches in ISP in China. So while you may be thinking that, yes, some of these devices that are sitting on the internet that are not secure are somebody at home playing with their Cisco device for the practice for their CCNA. Yes, that's entirely possible, but there are infrastructure level switches and routers that are ac accessible via the internet requiring no authentication at all. So I wanted to take a look at some other Cisco devices that are on the internet. This is a, a Cisco Aeronet 3, 350 series access point. Uh, typically, um, once you're getting into Cisco level gear, uh, you're talking small businesses or larger. Uh, people in their homes are using Linksys, Netgear, that sort of thing. Uh, once you get up into the brand name Cisco, you're talking about small businesses or, or above. So this is the web interface for a, a Cisco Aeronet uh, access point. This is the home page. And I'm going to jump through some slides here just to show you. This is the exp express setup page. This is a security page. So there's no security on this device at all, but you could actually turn it on, and then people who are access, accessing the access point wouldn't be able to access it without, without the security. This is um, interfaces for the page, security, uh, services, if you wanted to turn on certain services or turn off certain services that are running on the device. Uh, as you can see here, required no authentication to get into this, and we've completely owned this device right now. We could do whatever we want with it. This is a um, Catalyst 2960, so it's another Cisco switch. This is a web interface. Um, and uh, this device, um, or one very similar to it, you can see here that the uh, owner of this device was very descriptive in labeling all his ports. Uh, which is very useful for us in telling us uh, what they're going to. There's another example that I don't have here. <coughs> that was a, a business, a real estate company in New York City. And um, it had offices in different buildings that it owned. And in each, uh, for each port, it labeled the, the office that it was going to or the name of the business that it was going to. In other words, uh, second floor uh, Joe's Pizza Shop or whatever. Uh, and it listed the business, very descriptive. So you could just, you know, for example, if I were to uncheck one of these enable boxes, or I could just shut off the internet to that port, so that whoever has access to that port, they, they'd, be, they'd be done. Of course, we're not going to change the configuration of any devices. This is a Cisco series device manager for yet another Cisco device. I'll stop picking on Cisco in a little bit. I'm just going to kind of roll through some of these screenshots because I want to make sure I have time to get to the other uh, examples. The reason I show you all these pages is to show you that just access them were, were no authentication at all, just wide open. D 
default passwords. So this is a very low hanging fruit a search. We're just searching for devices that may be using default passwords. And we're just using the simple search of default password. Doesn't mean that the device itself is going to use the default password, but if they're advertising it, then they're already telling us what it might be. So this is a, this is actually the first, the very first result I found. This is a 401. We know that a 401 is an unauthorized banner. It's going to come back as a username and password. And the WW Authenticate box says basic realm default password 1234. Again, doesn't mean that this device is using the default password, but at least they're telling us what it might be. And it's a web printer. It's a print server. So it's a web interface for a printer. So they, they don't list a username, but they list a password of 1234. We don't have a username, so it could be um, admin, it could be root, or it could be nothing. I think in this case, um, so what I wanted to do here was, like, I don't want to sit here and bang again and try multiple passwords against this box. And I'd love to say that I tried more than one, but I didn't. It, just the first one I tried worked. So I think I tried uh, just a null username, no username, and, and, and the default password. And my, my idea was, if, if I don't get it on the first try, I'm not going to do anything else. It just, you know, because... From, a, from an ethical and legal standpoint, we're probably really pushing up against the gray area here. So here's our username and password. And did it work? It did work. This is the web interface for the printer. Um, we could do whatever we want here. We print, just keep printing out test pages, uh, exhaust their paper supply, do whatever you want, you know. Not for, from a, from the standpoint of you know you know getting into their network, you may this may be just a small foothold here, but I mean you could be really annoying with some of the things you could do. Let's say you change the password, you, you know you change the default password to something else. Uh, now you can lock people out of their own printer, and they're having problems running it, and you you can just you can do whatever you want. So okay, so we picked on Huawei for a while, so now or we picked on Cisco for a while, so I figure well, let's pick on Huawei. So that's that's one of their big competitors in the world. Um, I searched for just a general Huawei search. And he, in this example, I'm, um, using the <coughs> I'm using the exclude filter, so the minus sign to exclude results that I don't want to see. So I'm just uh, getting the 300s and 400s out. I just want 200 OKs. So I got 283 results. And almost all of them were a Huawei ET523 which I have no idea what that is, Pull, plug it into Google. It turns out it's this thing right here. It's an Echolife ET523 IP phone. So it's a, via, it's a VoIP phone. Also turns out that most of these uh, phones are, um, the IP address is to some Venezuelan technology corporation. And if you go to their webpage, they got pictures of smiling Hugo Chavez all over the place. So if you don't like Hugo Chavez, you know, you could do something to their phones if you wanted to. So we saw in the, in the example of Cisco, when Cisco allowed us to view the page, there was no authentication. That was the wrong way to do it. This is the right way to do it. It's a 200 OK. We can still view the page, but it's still asking us for a password. So the page, that, the, the useful page is not this one, but the one behind it. Well, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the password? We don't know what the password is. Um, but what you can do is you can look up what's the default password for Cisco devices or what's the default password for a Cisco ET512 or 513 IP phone. And it turns out that if you put the, IP, the default password for this device into this particular one, it worked. Again, another example of where if I had tried the default password and it didn't work, I wasn't going to go any further. This one worked. This is the... Uh, this is the web interface for the phone. Again, there's like 200 or more of these phones on the internet. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of things you can do here. Uh, one of the things I do want to point out here is the firmware server path, which gives you a place for a URL. So let's say you had some rogue firmware for a phone and you wanted to upload it to the phone. You could just point it to your, your source instead of theirs. Um, and then there's all sorts of other things you could do, you know, changing the ringtones or, you know, making their phones do crazy things and, you know, but, you know, you could actually, you know, access their phone and do, you could get, if you uploaded some random, you know, some firmware, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to their phone. 
turn the headset gain up so that it just blows out their ear. I mean, just do whatever you want if you don't like them. Okay, 15 minutes to go. Uh, we'll run through a few other ones. This is a, this is required no username and password. This is a web interface to a SNOM VoIP phone. Uh, you can see here that, I know this is a little difficult to see, uh, these are all dialed numbers. So these are the outgoing numbers. This is the per who the person was calling. That's on this side here. Down lower we have uh, missed calls and received calls. Uh, also with the caller ID. So this is someone's home phone that they're using. They're using VoIP for their home phone. And we can see everybody they're calling. So let's see. Who did he receive calls from? Thrift Savings, Merrill Lynch, Peak Alarm Company, Vulcan Materials, University of Mississippi. Uh, yeah, just right, wide open. There's a lot of these out there. Imagine what you could do with this information. So... Um, Let's say you were trying to get information out of this guy. You could call him up and spoof your caller ID to one of these numbers, or you could say, I'm calling from this place where he's already expecting a call from, or we called you earlier, but you weren't home. He knows he had a missed call then. There's a lot of things you could do with this information. Okay. I originally call this infrastructure exploitation, and that sounds like so technical and academic, and I like to be more fun, so I call this how to pwn an ISP. We saw an example of a Cisco web interface before. Here's another one. This is a Cisco WS33750, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to run through this uh, quickly. Uh, this is the web interface. This is the um, show IP route. This is the show running config. By the way, I'll, have a, I'll give you a place where you can get all these slides so that you can look at them in more detail if you want. The show running config. When you look at the running config, it lists a whole bunch of VLANs, and these are the VLANs listed in the configuration. Uh, management, <coughs> OTC net, building wireless, lab network, public, backbone, Hilton Convention Center, Courtyard Marriott, protected backbone, MPLS backbone. So let's take a look at these. This is the Courtyard Marriott in Cocoa Beach. I wonder who supplies their internet. I wonder if it's this device. This is Cypress Fairways. It's a private residence in Orlando. This is the Hilton Orlando Hotel. Uh, all these places have internet from the same place, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute. <laughs> the village at Lake Lily, very nice-looking condominiums in Orlando. The Rosen Convention Center. I, I know I'm skipping through these, so there's a lot of stuff to cover. It turns out that this switch, along with another switch and another core router... We're exposed to the internet, no username and no password, and they belong to an ISP in um, Orlando called Orlando Telephone Company. So if this was in Venezuela, I wouldn't really care, but this one was in Florida, and I was a little concerned that, so what could I do with this variation? I could route the entire traffic from the ISP to somewhere else, like my house, and then capture all the data that's going across it, and then send it right back to its original destination, or do whatever I want. Sniff the traffic for whatever passwords, usernames, financial data, whatever I want. So I've, at this point, I've already owned the ISP. But what do I want to do about it? So Orlando Telephone Company, this is them. Uh, I always like when companies have these, you know, these certified, you know, checkmark, you know, hacker safe, you know, things, what, because they always, that, that's a target to me. Um, it turns out um, all these things were available. Two Cisco 3750 uh, switches, a Cisco 7606 router, VLANs for all their stuff, SNMP addresses, if I have the information in here. So let me give you a very short story. I contacted the ISP. I said, um, your, your, your fly's down, basically. Uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> They actually offered me uh, money for, for finding it, which they never sent me in the first place in, the, in, the, in this long story. Um, but um, they, were very, uh, they were very happy that that, that information uh, came out. They had added these devices to their network, and they just they didn't lock them down. 
So you can imagine what you what you could do again with that traffic. You could just you could do whatever you wanted. Skater devices, ten minutes to go. Um, in addition to uh, routers, switches, there's uh, skater controls that are con uh, connected to the internet. This is getting scary. Uh, you you may I'm sure you you've heard of Stuxnet, uh, which was uh, you know designed to attack. Um, Siemens uh, Step 7 devices. So in about, uh, th what I'm going to show you in the next few slides, I did in about 15 minutes of research because I wanted to see what, I, I'm not a malware sort of guy, but I want to see what I could find in, the, in this short amount of time. So uh, I want to say, well, a Siemens Step 7 controller, which is what the Stuxnet uh, was designed to attack. So what could I find out about this in 15 minutes? Well, it uses a, an, a web interface called Somatic HMI MiniWeb. Well, so I searched for that in Shodan and, and Google as well, and I found this web interface. And I didn't require a username and password. I didn't put in a username and password, but you can watch, look at a whole bunch of different devices. So um, you can download. There's, so you may require certain software to, to interface with this web interface, and they, they have links to the software there, so you can install it on your own computer. Um, there's a system diagnostics page. Now, again, none of this, I, I haven't logged in. There's a system diagnostics page, which is giving you all sorts of error values. But there's IP addresses in here. There's other information that's useful. So this, this information should not be on the internet. I, can, I already know what their IP range is, what some of their device names are, without even logging into their web interface. Again, 15 minutes. Uh, file browsing, uh, and again, if you had uh, the username and passwords to these devices, you could probably um, you you know, log in and find more. Uh, and finding the default username and password to these devices was not difficult. It took me about five minutes. Other examples, you've seen webcam people playing with webcams on Google. There, are, you can find them on Shodan as well. This is a pan and tilt webcam. These ladies in uh, Japan, I think, were diligently working at their desk, and dis despite all the panning and tilting that I did, they would not be distracted. Um, uh, the translations for these are uh, for these uh, buttons here are, are snapshot and and client. And it turns out this was actually viewing the page in Firefox. And if you viewed it in Internet Explorer, it actually had a third option, which was a setup config, which allowed you to go into the entire configuration of the device and do whatever you want. This is one of those examples where uh, if you don't understand the language that you're looking at, a lot of times if you, you know, hover over the text down here in the status bar, uh, the underlying HTML is often in English, even if the, even if the language on the page is, is different. So that's very easy to find out. That's how, I fit, that's how I translated all these without knowing Japanese, or I think it's Japanese, yeah. So general observations, IS 5.0, Windows 2000. There's 362,000 of these devices on Shodan, more, probably more. IS 4.0, 10,000. IS 3.0, we're, we're back in like the mid, mid, late to mid 90s now. IS 1.0 is Windows 3 point something about 1994, 1995-ish, so we're talking about 16 years old. Yeah, there's devices on the internet that are still running that. You think they're vulnerable to something? Probably. Conclusions. Okay, Shodan aggregates a significant amount of information. That's You could do this yourself. Of course you can, but someone's already done it. It's already out there. Uh, it's not already widely available in easy-to-understand format. This allows us to do passive vulnerability of the analysis. In, mo in many of these cases, we didn't have to even go to the site to know that it was potentially vulnerable to something. So it's really nice. Uh, it's a potential game changer for penetration testers. Uh, this isn't going to take over the world. However, this is just another tool to put in your toolbox uh, and helps uh, shape the path for future vulnerability assessments. A lot of people see me do this brief, and the first thing they do is they go back to Shodan and they type in the, the IP of their, you know, the IP range of their company and find out what's 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 open and what's not meant to be there. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, uh, and I will uh, take questions for the remainder of the time. These are the guys who, um, the John Matterly is the guy who designed Shodan. Um, uh, after we're done, I will give you a actually. I'll put this on here now, just so people who are watching the video, if you want the slides to this presentation,
and I ran out of space. So the, the URL for the slides is www.scribe.com. Scribe is a document uh, website and the Prez 98. I have some older versions of this presentation there already, but this one should be up by tonight. So if you're looking for that, you can just look for it and it'll be specific to the presentation we talked about today. Um, five minutes left for your questions. Anyone? Uh, questions about the presentation, questions about Booz Allen, questions about my previous, anything that I've done, wide open. I haven't. I haven't actually. No. I mean, uh, I, it would be interesting to look at to see what's available. Um, Shodan, uh, just like any other search engine, uh, it's probably impossible to cover the entire internet. So there's, I would say, large swaths of the internet have been covered by Shodan, but there's there, you may encounter sections, portions of the internet that haven't been scanned yet. Any other questions? One thing I will add um, about, about the program that you have here is you guys are way ahead of the game. Well, I went to school just even 15 years ago, and you could be a computer science major, and, um, which means you were probably a programmer, and that was it. There was no other options. Uh, and uh, most of the people I work with, probably a, a lot, probably a majority of the people I work with doing my kind of work, doing this work, are social science majors. We're I'm a political science major. History majors, English majors, all sorts of things. Yes, there are technology majors too, but there are a lot of us social science majors who are doing this work. So you guys in a program like this, uh, a very technical program, are already way ahead of the game from, from what we were you know, even 15 years ago. Uh, www.scribe.com uh, slash the Prez 98. Is, is it really S C R I B D? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Scribe is a place where people put like uh, Word documents, PDFs, um, basically on any subject that you could possibly think of. Uh, notes from classes, um, outlines, papers, all sorts of stuff. So very good for, uh, for useful for documents. Thank you. I'll give you one bit of uh, one bit of career advice that has that has definitely helped me. Um, as you guys uh, move into the job field, you may start looking at job advertisements or job re requirements, um, and they'll say required, you know, X years of experience, and we want this degree and that degree. Um, as someone who's involved in in doing technical interviews uh, and and someone involved in the hiring process. Uh, it's very, you very rarely find someone who fits all those requirements. Um, so don't let those requirements um, stop you from applying for a job. Say it require we want five years of the experience in this. Well, I only have three. Apply for it. Just do it. What's the worst that can happen? You get an interview and they say no. Big deal. You got interview experience. It's a good. It's you know. You can never, you will never get hired for a company that you don't say, you know, you don't ask or you don't, you know, you don't say, you know, can I have an interview? If you just sit on, you sit on your hands, they're not going to hire you. My current job, there's no way I would have got hired if I looked at, if I looked at the actual requirements for what they wanted, compared them against mine, and said I don't meet those requirements, and I, I got hired. So, thanks everybody, I appreciate it.